Welcome to the DevOps for Data Science Book Club. Uh, if you're here, you probably know everything that's on this slide pretty much. Um, we are going to be reading DevOps for Data Science by Alex Gold. This book is very much in progress. And so this should be interesting to, to see how it goes. Um, these notes that I'm using are available at r4ds.io slash do4ds. Um, and they're set up as a book down for us to all kind of share and work on and uh, update as we go. All right, so the meetings. Um, I don't know if you have both done other clubs, but if so, or even if so, we'll go through it. Uh, every week, a volunteer will present a chapter um, or part of a chapter. I'm not sure how long these chapters are yet, so we'll see how this goes, or maybe sometimes more than one chapter. Um, I highly recommend signing up to present. That is definitely the best way to present or to learn. And uh, it might not be that many of us. So please don't make me do all the chapters. Um, the presentations usually, uh, I tend to do it as kind of a slide deck, slide deck summary of the chapter with the hopes that we'll discuss it a little bit around it. But um, sometimes it might be uh, something more of a live code kind of walkthrough. Um, Usually, it's still even even if you're going to do live code, having it canned on slides is usually better, um, unless you want to kind of work something out. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, we have the GitHub repo that is linked from the book, you know, up here um, and there, and it's in the channel. Um, talks about how to like set everything up to use the shared notes. Um, as you probably heard as you came in, everything is recorded and we put it up on the YouTube channel so that if you miss a week, you can catch up through YouTube. Um, and one of the other clubs had this quote, which I love, uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And the point of that is everyone should speak up because there's things I don't know that you know, there's things, you know, all of us don't know different, we know different things. So don't be afraid to ask questions or to, you know, interject with some cool piece of information that you know or that you read or whatever. Um, right, any questions about the general way that the meetings will work? And you'll see, I keep like looking over to the side. I have a second screen over here that you guys are on. So uh, that's what that's about. All right. Yeah, I got, um, so yeah. you know what you're presenting, should we just fork the repo and put our notes in there in an RMD and then just make a like pull request or something? Yeah. Or just... Yeah. So if we here, let me load this up, um, if we go to the GitHub repo. Uh, yeah, that was going to be my question too. So there are instructions down at the bottom. Of um, it is a book down. So if I go back over, like it's set up with all of the chapters in one deck. It's not perfect. Like the the slides are only kind of slide like. They're in between a book and slides. And it does sometimes lead people to write things that are way more like a book than like slides. I really encourage you to try to keep it slide-like. Um, but the idea is that way it's all together. You don't have to do that, um, but it's nice. And so then, you know, the idea is you, um, I highly recommend using use this, uh, the package use this to do all of this because it just makes your life easier. Um, and you can use create from GitHub, get your copy, your fork of the, uh, notes and then make a PR. Um, the other nice thing about this setup is we've got a description file which holds any um, packages that we use, we put in here. And then when you're working on it, uh, you can just um, like add to that, or, or you can add your anything you use there, but you can also just run a, there's a dev tools command, uh, install dev depths that will. Uh, install anything that other people have used. And so that way you can keep up, you know, we can keep each other up to date on whatever packages we're using. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, again, it's all there. Uh, when you are when you sign up to do a chapter, I recommend reading through this and ask me any questions you have. If you're not f familiar with GitHub, um, I think this club is more likely to have people who are familiar with GitHub, but maybe not. Maybe that's part of why you're reading the book. Um, I would be happy to help you get set up. Did that answer the question? All right. Uh, for pace, like I said, probably we'll do about a, a chapter a week. Uh, there ended up being a lot more 
like introductory material in this book than I expected when I signed it up. So we're actually going to do chapter one next week. And I did everything up to chapter one. Um, and actually, it's entirely possible that I won't take uh, anywhere near the full hour today. Um, I don't know. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but yeah, so try to do about a chapter a week. But if, if you're working through it and you're like, I feel like I've done a ton, just stop. <laughs> you know, feel free to just say, hey, this is as much as I can do. Um, and as we're presenting, sometimes you'll only get through half your notes, and that's fine too. Um, on the other hand, if you're if you you know sign up for chapter three and you read chapter three and it's like two pages long. And or it's longer than that, but everything can be summarized really quickly or anything like that. Uh, feel free to say, hey, I'm going to do four as well or that kind of thing. Um, we'll try to meet every week, but we will have some breaks. Um, and actually, I don't think I have a particular slide talking about that. So let's oops, I have an extra copy of that. There we go. There is this um, sign up to the volunteer to present. It's pinned in the channel. It's also on the uh, GitHub repo. Um, and the idea is just come in here and put your name. If you can put uh, first and last name, that's helpful to me when I'm uploading them to YouTube so I can copy paste who presented. Um, and yeah, just come in and sign up. We do have a lot of breaks uh, coming up. So the first one is because uh, Europe ends daylight savings a week before the United States. And then other countries don't observe it at all. And it's just, it's a mess for that week. Um, we're an international group. And so I just cancel all book clubs for that week all across the site. Um, otherwise there are different book clubs that try to, they're like, oh no, we don't have to change because we're all in Europe. It's like, yeah, but then you run into another club. So just no, no clubs that week. Um, and then for ours, because I screwed up, Basically, uh, we are overlapping with the R4DS Project Club, which meets the, on the second Saturday of every month. And so every second Saturday, you'll see there's a Project Club uh, break. Um, I encourage you to come to that if you uh, already are already free in this time slot, but um, that's a separate thing. And then I, I put a break in here for Thanksgiving um, because I'm gonna have family in town. Um, if there's anything else where everyone, you know, we're a small group. So if, uh, if it's going to be hard to meet, um, we should just take a break probably. But on the other hand, we should try to meet, um, at a pretty steady pace because it's easy for the club to kind of fall apart. Uh, we have a couple of different cohorts right now that are just limping along. They're trying to finish, but they keep, you know, they're, uh, relatively small and they'll be like, oh, one of us can't meet, so we won't meet. And then, you know, they don't finish. So even like that Thanksgiving one, I can't make it. But if uh, at least, you know, if, if there are only three of us and two of you want to meet, then that's fine. Like, let's keep this thing going. I'll walk, catch up on the video. Um, but I do think, you know, most likely we'll want to skip the Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve meetings. Um, and then there's the Project Club interruptions. Um, because this is a book that is actively being written and the author is like super happy that we're doing this, I'm going to try to get him in uh, at the end of each section to, for us to kind of ask him questions, uh, him to ask us questions probably, um, and just kind of to, to um, summarize things. I also, I haven't put... You know, I learned as I was doing the notes today that the in the um, section intros are pretty substantial. So I don't know if we'll want to go over them when we do the wrap up of the previous section, if we'll merge them into the chapter that starts the section or what we'll do. So again, that'll be something that we see as we go. Um, any questions about the schedule? All right. No. <laughs> All right, um, you will see on the slides as I get to like the beginning of a proper section or a proper chapter that I put learning objectives. Um, when you have learning objectives uh, while you're reading, you retain more information. I, I work in education, so uh, this is a big thing to me. Um, so uh, every club, I've been actually kind of surprised because I started doing this for the initial clubs just 
as a thing I did kind of for me. And all the other clubs have adopted it. Um, I'm going to rate these ones, probably. I'm going to try to have them done by Tuesday each week. Uh, but if you like disagree with me, feel free to change them in. So I wanted to give a couple of tips on how to, how to read them and how to think of them when you're writing them. Um, the general idea is it's, you're finishing the sentence. When you finish reading this chapter, you will be able to, and then those are the learning objectives. Um, usually it works out to roughly one per, uh, like the subsections within the chapter. Um, but it's, that's very, very rough. And then there are other things like if you find yourself using the word and a lot, that's probably two learning objectives. Um, you know, they, but we don't want to make them so tiny that we have like a thousand of them. So uh, it tends, you know, we tend to want to aim at like three to six per chapter or something like that. And it's just kind of what are we doing? Then again, I haven't seen these chapters yet. Maybe some of them have a ton of things in them and there will be more. Um, we'll see how that goes. All right. Any questions about that? Like I said, I'll probably do them. So hopefully it'll just, it, oh, I guess the other thing is when we have them in place, it kind of helps. It, it, I use them to structure the slides that I write out the learning objectives and then say, okay, I probably need a slide or two per learning objective um, or, or like a section of slides per learning objective. All right. Oops. All right. So that takes us to the actual intro of the book. Um, he, uh, uh, what I saw as the learning object, uh, yeah, objectives. Oh, I guess another tip on these is I use some, uh, like educational theory -y words. So recognize that's a tip that I'm saying, uh, you don't really have to like know this. It's just something that, um, you want to be able to, you know, you want to be able to answer multiple choice questions about it. <laughs> this is basically the idea, uh, versus, um, differentiate between DevOps the, which is the knowledge, practice, and tools, and IT or admins, which are the people and the roles. I think that was something that he really wanted to get through in here. Um, oh, yeah, I've got a ty typo here, but we want to recognize red flags about IT slash admin functions and what they might indicate. And then we want to kind of be able to organize the content that will be covered in this book. So I will dive into each of those. All right, so what is DevOps? Um, DevOps grew out of uh, the agile software development movement. And there's a like hard, uh, what they call a start date on that because the agile manifesto was published in 2001. So all of like the, I mean, there were things that led up to it, but the idea of agile software development uh, started in 2001. And the idea there is you deliver small units, uh, you collect feedback and you iterate. So it's try, trying to keep development into loops small cycles instead of like six month release cycles or year long release cycles. It's just deliver something right away. And because of that, like, you know, part of that's deliver and the software teams are, are writing the software, they're not actually deploying it. And so because the software teams wanted to deploy all the time, this thing came around DevOps uh, to get the iterations out to users. Um, Alex puts it at about 2010 is when the system or the discipline of DevOps really kind of became a thing. Um, it had been growing up until then, but as of 2010, it was basically a thing. Um, any questions or thoughts around that stuff? I feel like I want to read the Agile Manifesto now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have worked at, or I did work at startups around then. And so um, I can't remember if I read the actual Magical Manifesto, but I heard like the, the preaching of it. It gets a bad rap um, because of certain ways that Agile gets implemented, but the general idea is really good. Like it is how almost all software runs now where um, one of the mantras is fail fast. So yeah. if you don't want to spend a year developing something and then find out that no one wants it, um, right. so get something out, even if it's not perfect, and find out if people really want it. Uh, so yeah, yeah it sounds really, it sounds really <laughs> interesting. I I um I don't have as much, nearly as much experience as you, but the short time that I was with <laughs> um in in the tech industry, it was 
it was very clear that like they just wanted you to like just break things <laughs> yeah it, it's a break it forward. it's an interesting way of doing things but it's i mean it it works really well for a lot of companies so um, and do you, do you think that um so like beyond that there's like you know scrums and all of these other <laughs> um like philosophies that have grown out of it do you think that um one of the reasons i i was thinking this when i was reading the chapter is something that was really interesting to me is that like because there's no <clears throat> there's no like academic um backing towards these principles that things just can sort of just grow out of hand like really really quickly because every company wants to implement it their own way i yeah i think there is some of that um there's some like companies that are not actually agile themselves like the the style of the company still yeah. it's the buzzword and so and actually and all their devs want to they don't want to be working on year-long cycles they want to be working on shorter iterations so that yeah. can be all that can lead to messiness um i have certainly seen some of that uh at times and, and then there's some people got like you know scrum is is an agile methodology and it has um a structure that sometimes people adhere to too closely like mm. they don't it's technically like one of the things that's part of scrum is you're supposed to every two weeks like evaluate what you're doing and change processes if they're bad if they don't work for you but people mm. leave that piece out and they just stick with like what they read scrum is supposed to be um so that can be a problem we do uh, uh my little micro team does two week sprints um kind of like we we do a combination of scrum and then the kanban is where you just kind of have a continuous flow we do every two weeks kind of check where we are think about like major uh, not major, but, you know, things that we want to finish within the two weeks. But uh, during the sprint, we're pretty uh, open to, oh, no, this ticket's a bad idea. Let's not work on that yet. Let's do this other thing. Um, so even within, like, data science, we, we try to look at what, you know, what are we going to do for the next two weeks? Uh, the idea of that being that you can tell people, okay, I will do that, you know, if something's really important, you can put it into the sprint, but otherwise you can use the, we just started a sprint, I'll get to that in two weeks. So they're not constantly trying to feed things into your queue. Um, and so like, I'll let you know in two weeks if that makes it into our next sprint, something like that. Uh, that can be surprisingly useful to kind of cool off things that people think are emergencies, but you can see, you no, know, like you just want to know this eventually. I'll get to you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's only two weeks. So it's time yeah. to like come back to it. Um, all right. Have you have you guys found with agile stuff though, the worry is that like you never actually get back <laughs> after the sprint to kind of evaluating, going back and checking things. Then you get technical debt build up. You you can, um, for sure. Uh we I don't know. I mean, my team is two of us, <laughs> and so we're a lot better <laughs> about the, you know, like, uh, let's stop and work on this thing, you know, oh, hey, this thing um, we didn't get to, like, it's it's hard to hide behind uh, someone else worked on that because we both know everything that's being worked on. Um, but yeah, that definitely can be a problem. Um, and that's actually, I think that's a big part of why DevOps exists is uh, to have things in place for like how to deploy, but also have all the testing um, all the just various practices to try to help uh, keep the technical debt to a minimum. And so that's a good lead into. So what is uh, DevOps versus IT? Um, so DevOps is the knowledge, the practices, the tools, it's how to put things into production and uh, do so safely and easily versus uh, and a lot of time people think of DevOps as the people but he differentiates that there's the people or the roles who manage the servers, uh, that kind of thing. 
they can have many names. You can have you know, IT, information, information technology. They can be sysadmins. Um, they can be site reliability engineering or SRE. Uh, we've got a team at my uh, company that is called SRE. Uh, they can be called DevOps. Um, there can be subdivisions. We're going to go to, into that a little bit about um, that can sometimes be a warning sign if it's like a million teams, but also um, a lot of times the DevOps roles are in teams and that's not, that's actually usually a good sign. Um, but yeah, so there are people who like own the servers and stuff, but there's this practice of, um, you know, make sure everything's testable and reproducible and all this stuff. The practice is what he defines as DevOps, which is good because I don't want to be the people, <laughs> but I want to uh, deploy things and, and make sure my stuff is easy to deploy, um, all that kind of thing. Any, anyone have any other thoughts on this? No, I think anything I'm kind of wondering is probably going to come up at some point <laughs> in this thing. Um, so I'll keep stum. Fair enough. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, he had some some red flags about those IT roles or uh, individuals. One thing to watch out for, like I said, sometimes it's um, super subdivided. So you might have a security team and a database team and a networking team and a cloud team and whatever. Um, the nice thing about this is uh, the person who, or the team that is the security team is gonna know everything or probably gonna know everything that they could know about security as it relates to your company or your whatever you're working with. Um, so that can be nice. Uh, but the con is it can be really hard to find the right person. And I, I'll say that the company I work at is in this, uh, has this red flag. We have a, a bunch of different people, different teams that do different little pieces of the IT, um, you know, possible package. And it does have the pro, but sometimes it can be like, oh, I, I thought you were the person to come to for this, but it's actually this other entirely different team. Um, and so sort of tracking that down can be painful. We're not, I mean, it's like a few teams. Like I think some places there are like dozens of teams that are at IT. Um, so it's not that bad, but so there's that. Uh, the next red flag to watch out for is often it's outsourced um, because that allows companies to get actual uh, IT in place fast. Um, but uh, this, the main con is that outsourced usually means offshored. And so the time zone differences can be a pain for scheduling, figuring things out. And because it is, you're hiring a company, you're not hiring a person. A lot of times there's really high turnover. And so you just get to know, oh, this is the person to talk to. And these are the kinds of questions they always want you to answer. And then it's a different person and they might need different information. Or, or have a different way of dealing with things. Um, and then the, the last red flag that, I, and it's, it's actually funny. I have, I have gone through all three of these at various times. And the third one is that there's nobody. And so the, the pro of that is, okay, it's up to you, do whatever you want. And the kind of that is it's up to you, figure out what you have to do. Um, this one, like the, there are different styles of nobody because, uh, like how much freedom you actually have depends on, you know, like the checkbook that you're given access to basically. And if you have actual freedom to do things, it, it can be nice, but then you got to learn all the things. So, um, yeah. So have, I don't know, have you, have you had any experience with any of these? Yeah. yeah. I outsourced myself. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's the, the, not just like the uh, turnover of the like people within the outsourcing company. Like we in previous jobs kind of had like high turnover of companies oh. so contracting, which is just the almost even worse because the whole thing changes. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, that can definitely be um, be a problem. One thing uh, I don't know that's interesting or sad or you know it's like. It's not like you can really do anything about these. Like you can maybe not accept a job, but past that, it's like uh, depending on how much influence you have within the company, um, it's you just kind of got to live with this type of stuff sometimes. Um, yeah, that's kind of yeah. preempted my question. I was wondering if 
is it Alex, the guy from our studio, is, mm. is the author, whether he talks yeah. about like how to kind of break these barriers down or like to kind of set about uh, fixing these uh, red flags. But I think he probably does in section two and he, maybe in section three, which is really um, not really written yet. Um, to, to a degree, he would talk about some of this stuff. Like um, a lot of what he's going to be talking about is uh, like relationships with these people. And so I think that will help um, deal with it. And then I think section I think section three is largely going to be about that third case. Like, here are the things you need to know in, in order to just do it. Um, I suppose it's difficult, right, to know, say, when you're in one of these three. Say, if you're the nobody, like, at what point do you have a good kind of argument to go to stakeholders um, and try to make it so you're not anybody, you're not nobody anymore? Like, <laughs> someone else in, like, where does the cost and benefit? I guess it's completely like, company dependent um would be interesting yeah. to maybe get a bit of advice on that kind of thing yeah i think um it all comes down to basically what is um what's being left on the table like hey i could be doing all these things but i can't because i don't have i I'm, i don't have this expertise or maybe you know maybe through this book that will kind of develop this expertise um, and then you'll be like, okay, now I'm that role. Uh, and now you need data people. So, um, yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's easier to find in general. So like a, a good solid data scientist or like uh, and someone really experienced with DevOps, MLOps and stuff. I think, so I, I was going to say, I think general DevOps, probably relatively easy to find, but data science focused DevOps, um, you know, ML ops, uh, and, and just dealing with like, you know, administering dashboards and that kind of thing. That's not the quite the same as your general DevOps people. Mm -hmm. So um, that's probably a smaller set. So it's a smaller, like, well, slightly smaller requirement, although pretty much everyone has some sort of data science function now. Um, but it's probably yeah. a smaller pool of people. I've started to see stuff just like I get targeted for by I don't know, recruiters or ads or whatever. Mm -hmm. and I started like full stack data scientists. <laughs> I would that never apply. Any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you say that, John, because I I mean, I'm I'm in my late twenties, so I'm in the pool of people who are, you know, learning and going to university and trying to, you know, get into the job market and like everybody wants to be a data scientist nobody wants to do full stack or devops right. or or it you know everybody who works in tech is like how to do machine learning <laughs> well that's all they care about that's true um yeah i don't know i don't know what path takes you down into being uh like a an it a, a sysadmin or a sorry type um so yeah, that it's true that I don't know of anyone who wants like wants that role, but then people end up in it. So <laughs> I, I think yeah, I think a lot of a lot of the people doing this kind of thing tend to be more senior, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, because you have like one person who usually is administering like for a lot of other people. And so you know, you don't have as many of these people, and therefore they end up being fairly senior i think yeah um and i think i end up generally with like a mix of some a senior person plus an outsource that they work with has uh been a pretty common um situation but yeah that's a good point like i think more and more data scientists are becoming pretty common because so many people want to do it um so. all right all right, so this book, um, it's divided into three sections. Uh, the first one is Patterns and Principles to Grease the Path to Production. So it's stuff that we should be doing purely as a data scientist in order to make DevOps, like make our relationship with the IT people go better. Um, section two is learning like more and more about uh, what the like uh, 
IT people do. Um, largely, he's he's saying that the focus is going to be towards like the vocabulary, so you can talk to them. But there's also some do-it-yourself stuff in there. And then the idea is section three will be, you know, how to do all the things. Um, I mean, presumably not all the things, but <laughs> you know, how to do the um, running your own Amazon uh, Web Services account to some degree and all that. Uh, that section, he said it, he's gonna, like it's, it's. we shouldn't read that yet, <laughs> um, but he said, he thinks he'll be well ahead of us. So um, hopefully that, that holds true. We did have another book club that we did while they were writing the book for um, Tiny Modeling with R and we had to pause because like we ran out of chapters. Um, it's possible that will happen here. Uh, We'll talk about that if we come to it, because we might like do some projects or we might whatever, do some things to fill the time if he's close behind us. Um, but I think he'll stay ahead. We'll see how that goes. Um, oh, this little section where he uh, talks about what's coming up in the book, there's this like there's kind of a mess at the bottom of it of here are the chapters and part of it has a table and there's all this stuff. He said, oh, yeah, that's totally for me just ignore that. <laughs> so he's still working on that. So I was like, you know, you might want to structure these to be a little bit more of a match. And he's like, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> and like, that's not, that's not anything. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, oh, that, I mean, that does lead me to, he is very, very appreciative. As I read these and wrote these notes, I um, did a couple of pull requests of, hey, I found some typos or this wording was confusing, that kind of thing. Um, so uh Feel free to do that. I think it's a great way to just get practice with GitHub. Um, for typos, you can just edit right in uh, GitHub, and um, I don't know, it, it works out pretty well. Uh, and yeah, he'll love it. Uh, he has a little contributing guide in there that says basically you just have to say that you release the copyright, so he doesn't have a problem publishing the book when it uh, becomes time. All right. Um, so this takes us into this section at the beginning, you know, it comes before the first uh, six sections or so, um, or first, first six chapters or so, I mean, first five chapters, I think it is. Uh, so the, it's this section called DevOps Lessons for Data Science. Um, within this section, he's going to describe the core principles of DevOps, and then he's going to tell us how those apply uh, how those best practices apply to data science. All right. So he has these five tenets of DevOps and he talks about how like everyone, he's seen different lists and everyone has their own list, but I think this is a pretty good list. So the first tenet is that code should be well-tested and tests should be automated. Um, that's, you know, whatever, we'll talk about that. Um, updates should be frequent uh, and low risk. Security concerns should be considered upfront as part of your architecture, um, which uh, that's definitely a thing. Um, and production systems should have monitoring and logging. And then finally, frequent opportunities for review, change, and updating should be built into the system, both culturally and technically. So um, like this kind of overlaps with number two, but the idea is like have a culture of uh, it's okay to, or you should be doing things all the time. You should be changing things. You should be reviewing things all the time. Um, like this is basically, these five things are what the rest of the book is about. <laughs> I think this is basically what it comes down to. Uh, I don't, do, do you do any of this now? Like how, how is your pet testing? Uh, yeah, I write a lot of tests. I end up writing a lot, mainly unit tests though. So maybe not yeah. full system interaction tests, but occasionally for packages and stuff, some like integration tests and stuff. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to get like a professional's take on what is a good testing suite. Like how good does it have to be before it's good enough? Because um, like you can- Yeah. Always... Um, yeah, because like I, I, fairly obsessively try to get 100% coverage as far as unit tests and um, packages that I write. But you can get 100% coverage without really 
like testing yeah but does it does it really do what it should be doing and you know are there corner cases that you're not hitting and um all that kind of thing so it is it's uh it is it's an interesting line um but yeah i i like to test um underlying code like i don't i don't know that like the actual data science stuff that i do i test like i i guess i test it through doing it and through through the underlying code i don't know mm -hmm. um yeah, like testing a package versus testing the pre-processing pipeline and then the tracking right. of the models. It's kind of like a different ball game, right? Like, yeah. Is that like a well-defined space, do you think? Or is it not not to my knowledge, but I'll be interested to see how much he goes into. Yeah. I think I think he does go into it a little bit. Maybe it's in this section or if it's in the next section where he talks about how there's a significant difference between like the production environment, the um, testing environment, and the development environment. Um, and he basically says, like, the development environment for a software engineer is like buildings, is like is like building software, and it's very easy to send it to test because you know what it's going to be. But for a data scientist, it's like, here's a notebook. Right. How do I test? <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Um, or, like if I'm going to have some sort of report that I'm building and we like the whole point is we don't know what people are going to be doing and we want to be able to figure out what they're doing or exactly. Or so, um, yeah, like it might fail, fail a test, so to speak. And it's like, yeah, because like the interactions have changed. <laughs> and so right. that's, we, we want that situation. So yeah, that'll be interesting. And I know like ML ops, the reason it has a different name is, uh, deploying and, and tracking and updating uh models is different than software um all right um i don't so I, i'm trying to get better uh at ci um continuous integration where i i do it a lot like fairly well for uh r4ds stuff like all the book clubs as we create notes they're tested um in the PR and then we, uh, you know, they, it automatically builds the book and all that. Uh, I'm not as good at it at work. Um, so, uh, I, that is something I'd like to get better about. Is um, that an thing or is that like difficult? It's harder to make for the work you do. It's, it's harder. And, uh, you can't, if you're working in private repos, you can't use the same processes as if you're working in open source repos um, to some degree. Like there, all the all the free tooling isn't free and you have to figure out how to get it set up for private stuff. Um, and some of the, you know, some of the work I do obviously is private. It's for, the, for uh, my business that I work for. So that's uh, something I need, need to get better about. And then it, there is some stuff that's just, I, I haven't really sorted out how to how to test um how to like some of the pipeline kind of stuff it's harder to really like I know that it I know it works but it's like uh again um hitting a, a database and like I'm I don't have that's the whole other book but <laughs> uh mocking things I'm not great at yet so getting the test to where they work without having to hit the actual database um, and therefore can run fast and frequently. Anyway, um, so the next slide is translating these or translating the general concepts to data science. And so that kind of hits on what we were talking about. Um, so he says, you know, a, a general concept in DevOps is that you should use uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, he he calls this code promotion and integration processes. That's the name of the chapter, chapter one. Um, and the idea is to structure everything so that moving to prod it, um, or updating it is as easy as, as it can be. Uh, like I said, I didn't actually get to that chapter. I got up to that chapter and then ran out of juice basically. Um, but that's the, so that's what we'll talk about next week. Um, and cool because like I said I do that in some ways but not everywhere 
uh, the next kind of, or I guess, stop on that for a sec. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? <laughs> so next, uh, like tenant of DevOps is that, uh, think of in infrastructure as code and his translation of that to data science is you should manage environments as code. So um, you want everything to be reproducible and secure. Um, so focus on making everything reproducible and secure. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting that he pulls Docker out as its own chapter. Not that's not um, in the reproducible part. So I don't know. I, I don't know yet if he goes into it a little bit in chapter two and then more in its own chapter, or or if he's say, pointing out other things um, for reproducibility. Um, yeah. Any thoughts there? <laughs> I think we've talked about a lot of these as we went, so I totally understand if you don't have anything to put in. Uh, I, I think I can just kind of see that it might make sense to have Docker as a standalone thing, just because it's almost like omnipresent, right? Right. Well, and I guess, you know, you can look at um, package management and, um, you know, uh, uh, care in how, how you uh, write your code for it to be reproducible for other people versus... Docker is like, no, okay, make the actual, the entire environment reproducible. So I could see that being separate. Um, all right, so next he, he talks about uh, microservices. It's a thing that a lot of uh, like normal software DevOps uh, focuses on. And the equivalent is data science project components. So figuring out how to subdivide things um, into atomic pieces so that updating something is less painful because you can just update the piece. Um, so that's a whole chapter. Um, and then as he says, you know, there's the DevOps concept of monitoring and logging and the data science concept is monitoring and logging. Um, we don't do enough of this, he talks about, and um, he's telling us he's going to go into how we should do monitoring and logging more. Um, I feel like those last two have been the, um, the hyper-focused of um, Vetiver. And uh, yeah, that our studio is doing right now. Yeah, um, yeah, Vetiver definitely. Well, it's it's uh, all of these really, I think, are uh, expressed through Vetiver. Um, for I don't know if you're familiar, Jack, but I, also anyone watching Vetiver is our studio's uh, R and Python package for deploying models. Um, it was the first thing that they publicly came out with that was aimed at both R and Python at the same time. Um, and it's deploying, uh, monitoring and updating models is what the whole, the, the focus is. So um, I think yeah, that is interesting. Where, but loosely, right? Um, so I kind of, I switched towards more Python for right. like, and machine learning stuff and haven't really caught the wave of tidy models yet kind of <laughs> been when it's like completely done i'll just switch to it because i'm so familiar and like know they're going to make a good thing but i've switched to maybe tensorflow and like um tf light and some other things that makes right. modeling and logging kind of really simple if you know a bit of keras um which is nice i think yeah i think part of the idea is they want to make it consistent no matter what you're using that you'll have the same logging process um so that's nice and that'll be I, i'm interested to see what he talks about in that chapter <laughs> and then he he says other things that there are other pieces other processes um he's going to have a chapter about docker for data science um because it deserves its own chapter and then the whole section two is about uh communication collaboration review practices um because a lot of people put like communication and collaboration into DevOps, but that's, you know, a whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, Did you guys follow um, the big, big science, the Bloom language model, the hugging face thing? I, I didn't. I mean, I know, I know about it. I know of it, but I haven't like. Really... That, that was, like using tensor borders, like one of the way. So you got the tensor whether you could watch the model train. I spent oh. like an inordinate amount of hours just watching the loss not move for like a week <laughs> and then come back. But it was pretty cool, like 
having it that visible. And I, I don't know if you'll touch on it, but Facebook for one of the big language models, I forget which, they they output like the whole change log and everything that had, all the bug fixes they've done throughout chain like training a language model. And right. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll sign up to present that one because I'll go digging for that and practical <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that um, you know, I am a big fan of doing as much in public as you can do. Um, and I think it like it keeps you honest, but it also like gives you free help. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all I think it's a big or it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, that's 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 everything that I have. Um, so like I said, for I'm going to try to write up some learning objectives for chapter one in the next couple of days and get them up on the repo. Um, so I guess, yeah, the first question is, uh, oops, not there. It's, um, I guess you're out next week, Jack. Yeah, I'm out next week, but I'm happy to do the following week if, if that works. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, I guess I can do the first one. All right. Um, <laughs> that works for me. Cool. Um, so, yeah, like I say, it's tempting to write like paragraphs, and I really advise against that, like write bullet points because um, you don't want to just be reading paragraphs to each other. Leave it as bullets so we can uh, have somewhere to talk. Yeah, um, I wrote the paragraphs already. <laughs> exactly. Um, cool. Uh, anyone have any other thoughts about this? Yeah. What's a good um, kind of like, to, do you leave in or do you pre-plan the points you're going to stop and allow for discussion and like rate <laughs> ask questions and stuff or what do you kind of do? So um, I don't, I don't, um, I try not to spend too much time prepping for these because it is just a book club. Like, uh, on the other hand, I did, I don't know, I spent a little bit more time trying to make sure, trying to figure out where the breaks were <laughs> for this one, as far as like, how far am I going to go? Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Like, as you're working on it, kind of be thinking about it, but also as you're presenting, you'll probably go, oh yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, this was weird because it's like, I there weren't, um, you know, points of, oh, I'm confused by this because he wasn't really getting to the material yet. He was talking about what he's going to talk about. Um, but I think, you know, there will likely be things as we are reading that, you know, whoever, whichever one of us is presenting will be confused by it. And definitely like, that's part of the point, stop and ask those questions for us to help each other figure it out. Um, or at some point it might be for us to make notes to ask Alex, uh, to figure it out. Actually, I want to, I'm going to try to set up a form or something that as we go through, if we have questions, we can gather them to plan for those times when he comes in. Um, so yeah, that'll be coming, but yeah, I, I, I don't have like, um, I don't do speaker notes for these or anything like that. Um, I would, I, I guess in other clubs, I might kind of put a question right in the bullet, like, or a, a sub bullet of uh, a, a little reminder of something that I wanted to stop and talk about. So that kind of thing can happen. Um, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with though. I don't have a ton of advice on these. Um, yeah. Yeah. I worry <laughs> it's like I'll blur out and go into a fugue state and just like not stop talking for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Everyone's just like, what just happened? Um, I think that can happen. So I am a fan of uh, large font, few bullets. Like the less you put on the page, the more that that kind of forces you to uh, discuss it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to a point. <laughs> like, don't don't take that too far. But uh, it's the purpose of the slides is to help you remember what that section was about, not so much to have all the information um yeah cool that's good to know yeah yeah <laughs>
not to okay. sweat too much right so that you got every detail like pristine in your mind that's cool yeah yeah you know we're not teaching a class we're we're all reading it together and um trying to remember what it was about so we know what what to discuss but it's not um we're not writing a book you know he already did that so we're just trying to remember uh what was mentioned and what questions we had what what we thought was an interesting point um so yeah sometimes I'll I'll just pull out like a quote would might be the whole slide for some for a section and then uh, go from there. We'll see we'll see how it goes. Um, I think they change a lot uh, each time I do one of these presentations because it depends on the chapter. Um, yeah. All right. Well, cool. That uh, that was a. There we go. I I was right to not do chapter one because it's about <laughs> perfect time. All right. I will see uh, at least one of you next week and hopefully some more people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Bye. Bye.